I love today because today I get like a double dose. It's kind of fun. Is that uh, one day a week I try to take some time off, you know, to do something different, <laughs> not be so digitally oriented that I'm no physically good, so to speak. That's a joke, by the way. But taking time, you know, to relax and to unwind or to reformat my mind to not be thinking in digital ways or to be constantly creatively writing or to be writing or posting or, you know, doing all the things that I do when I'm, because I'm a writer, then taking a chance to just get out and go and have fun. I love it. But you know what I like too? Is that I really like when I come back to recording devotionals, devotionals to literally sitting down and spending time with you who's watching and really with Jesus who's here. He's always here, but you know, it's kind of a time I get to reformat and kind of think in terms of devotion and in this case Spurgeon but times to have my mind and my thoughts directed by God to what he would be working in me then I'm excited because when I come back from after a day of resting and stuff and and kind of you know kicking back and doing what I want to do that I go for double the pleasure because I record twice as many because I have to get ready for the next day because I'm kind of like a day behind so I gotta be a day prepared just in case that the internet goes down or something but anyways I love it <laughs> I just think it's such a kick in the head to be able to enjoy the fellowship that I have with God with others but it's like having someone here to participate with me in sharing my relationship with Jesus it's it helps me to stay in the word and to keep going on with this you know little agreement and emotional to read all these and to go through them in one year and it's like cool this is fun you know it's like every day it gets better and better and I love it but then I also recognize that there's a serious quality to it because we live in the last days I mean, we're the last generation. I'm sorry, you know. If that if that's a bummer to your plans, oh well. Bummer, dude. <laughs> you know, and get real. When you look around the world, you see that the great revivals have passed America by. We're not in a revival. We're in a repentance time. There's no revival coming. There's no big, giant sweep through America, and we're going to suddenly, you know, like, turn our country around, and we're going to become, you know, number one, and we're number one. We're America. We're number one. We're patriotic. No, the reality is, is that our time has passed. We're coming into a judgment time of God where he's going to bring about the reality of who we are as believers. That in these latter days, will we act upon the grace that God has given us and shed upon our land and cause us to move out into those countries that now are open so that we could promote Jesus in them or are we going to be self-centered and focus inwardly to try to solve some social problem or try to give some freedom or to legate or make lawful some action or some participation forget all that when the Roman Empire was falling apart the church didn't care it went on its own way it was still busy promoting the gospel if you're busy trying to save America you're trying to save the wrong thing you don't save countries, you save people. The gospel is simply this. Go out into all the world and share the good news that Jesus gave you. Otherwise, when Jesus comes, what kind of servant were you? America will not exist in the kingdom of God. Sorry, it just won't. But the truth is, God will and Jesus will. So, let's be about the Lord's business and not so consumed with the things that... <laughs> really our worldliness. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Many persons want to know their election before they look to Christ, but they cannot learn it. Thus, it is only to be discovered by looking unto Jesus. If you desire to ascertain your own election after the following manner, 
Shall you assure your heart before God? Do you feel yourself to be a lost, guilty sinner? Go straight away to the cross of Christ and tell Jesus so. Tell him that you have read in the Bible, Him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. Tell him that he has said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If you feel and know that you're a sinner, come to Jesus. Look to Jesus and believe on him, and you shall make proof of your election directly. You are dealing one-on-one -on -one with God. And you shall make proof of your election directly, for so surely as thou believest, thou art an elect. If you will give yourself wholly up to Jesus and trust him, then you are one of God's chosen ones. He has chosen you for salvation. But if you stop and say, I want to know first whether I was elected, or my election, or my choice is one that God chose, you ask, you know not what. You don't really understand the point. Go straight to Jesus and hide in his wounds, and you shall know your election. The assurance of the Holy Spirit shall be given to you so that you shall be able to say, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him. That is your life. Commit it unto him, and he will bring it to pass. Christ was at the everlasting council. He can tell you whether you were chosen or whether you weren't. But you cannot find it out in any other way. Only Jesus can tell you, and he won't tell you till that day. Go and put your trust in him, and his answer will be, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. There will be no doubt about his having chosen you when you have chosen him. So many religious ideas come across with the concept of predestination and free will and making your election sure and all that garbage. <laughs> when in reality, if you think about it, Paul wrote all of that and already knew the answer. He shared the answer. So if he could share the answer, why are we still arguing the question? How come he knew the answer and we debate the issue? Honestly, because there is no question. The religious tried to, at some point in time, help you to become more like Jesus by trying to enforce a religious law, just like the Jews did. Enforce a religious law so that you would want to, so that you would try to, so that you would make yourself more righteous, more wanting God, more like God, rather than recognizing what God had done. And it sounded good at first. It was a good idea. It was put down on paper. They came up with this doctrine and this idea, and they said, oh, look, we could go this way. But then when people said, you know what, you've been beating us to death with this, and we are no longer looking at it as being righteous, but the people we thought were righteous are pedophiles. The people we thought were righteous are committing sins. The people we thought were holy are doing all manner of things that we're doing. So what good was that? So they decided to argue about whether or not these religious laws were as important as a spiritual law, which was the law of love, the law of grace, the law of mercy. And as they began to understand that God was love, they began to see, well, wait a minute, these people are arguing about whether there is a God, and these people are arguing about we know God, and then they don't meet, so we're going to have to come up with some kind of doctrine and explanation so that we could convince these other people that don't know God to know God by way of intellect. So they came up with more doctrines, and more confusion, and more religion, in order to explain what it is that they didn't really understand completely, but wanted to explain it anyways. Isn't that silly? Frankly, when you know God, when you know Jesus, there's no doubt. It's that simple. When people, start, when, when people try to explain it to you, it gets complicated. <laughs> Whenever I hear someone start to explain what they mean, I know that they're confused themselves because they can't just simply say yes is yes and no is no. I frustrate people because the first thing, I mean, I can argue religiously and the theologically and get my hermeneutic and homiletic and all my didactic and everything else down to a science, you know, and promote it all out there, but why? 
The reality is, do you know God? Yes? No. <laughs> or maybe. Well, there is no maybes. Yes or no. If you talk to God, yes. If you don't talk to God, no. Pretty simple. Okay, go to hell. That's the way I look at it. If you don't know God, you're going to hell. If you know God, you're not. Now, there are people that say, well, you know, you got to know more. Well, if God, if you know God, then God is talking to you. Then God is telling you, you need to know his son. And if God is telling you to know his son, then you're going to follow on unto salvation. It's a pretty simple logical progression. But if you don't know God and God isn't really speaking to you, then guess what? It's not about being deceived. It's about deceiving yourself. So, boil it down to the simplest denominator and find Jesus. And he'll tell you all about it in simple terms.